Hello, everybody. Hello, Prof. Good to see you all. Hello, Prof. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon for some of you, right? <laughs> so I've been looking at the Flipgrids at the Peer Teachings, and I only have, I got two more. So I got Glories and Brenda's. So I need Desire, Shepard, I need you to go ahead and finish up your effects of climate change presentation. Uh, Cause I actually want to put out more flip grids. I want to kind of go back and cover um, uh, the carbon cycle. That'll probably be the next one that you'll do. So you'll have to go back and review what we talked about the different carbon cycles, et cetera. Um, but complete this one. Cause I don't want there to be too many over your head. Um, and I'm looking forward to all of them. So last time we talked about epigenetics and you know the point behind that lecture was um, as we go through climate change, you know, we tend to think about, well, the speed of climate change is really gonna be a huge stressor for life on the planet. Evolution occurs at a certain rate. We talked a little bit about some of the fastest cases of evolution when we talked about um, uh, the different colored moths, right? And in that case, there were already the genes present. There were already the variation present um, that you could select from, um, which allowed for fast evolution. Normally when we have temperature changes, like we've seen over the last um, uh, several millennia going in and out of ice ages, uh, due to the Milankovitch cycles of going from um, uh, a highly eccentric orbit to a less eccentric orbit and back again, um, those temperature changes were usually about um, a hundredth of a degree per year or less. I mean, very, very small temperature changes over many, many years. 10,000 years to do about between a four to six temperature change and global temperature anomaly. Um, so that gives time for new genes, new mutations to evolve or to arise that then evolution can select for. Um, with the speed of climate change that we're seeing right now, plants and animals are under huge stress to adapt to them. Um, and this can be seen just in their genes, but also in these epigenetics modifications. And so as you continue on throughout the program, thinking about biotechnology solutions, um, you're going to be working with biology. So in the back of your mind, you should also be asking yourself, well, what, what's the role of epigenetics in this case? And, and what is that doing? In a lot of cases, it may not be studied. Um, so it's a whole new avenue of science, a whole new field, um, which is, is slowly gaining traction and might be something of interest um, for you later on. Um, so along with the theme this week has really been looking at, actually of the last two weeks, you know, we've, we started out saying, well, how do you measure temperature changes? We looked at anomalies and that's how you do that. Um, then we looked at what does the data tell us about what's going on in the world. And we see indeed there's tons of evidence that temperature is changing. The climate has been changing. It's about a 1.1 degree temperature rise since um, pre-industrial times. Um, from there, we look at the physics of what might cause temperature change and how the temperature of our planet is determined. Energy in has to equal energy out. And we saw those basic calculations. And then what happens when you add in a gas, like a greenhouse gas that can reflect infrared radiation because most of our black body radiation is in the IR range. And so we saw how that can further heat up a planet. And we ended up coming up with our favorite equation, which has an N for number of layers in it. And that helps us determine what the surface temperature will be. And so then we looked and a lot of different reasons why the temperature could be changing. And I think we've pretty much crossed out all of them, except for the addition of greenhouse gases. 
Um, and so then we looked at what are those greenhouse gases? Why would they be greenhouse gases? And we saw how CO2 heavily um, absorbs in the infrared region, the same region which we re-radiate out. Um, and then we looked at what, what, what is the carbon cycle? Where is all the carbon coming from? Where is it going? And so we talked about um, the atmosphere to land biosphere uh, um, cycle. We talked about the atmosphere to um, the mixed layer of the ocean cycle and how that cycles with the deep ocean. And then we also talked about um, the atmosphere um, uh, cycling carbon with the rock reservoir. So all of those things, you know, kind of contribute to where we see carbon and where it goes and how long it takes for when you add more carbon in the atmosphere, how long it takes um, to go into these other reservoirs. And so that's something really important to know. Um, in your next Flipgrid, you'll be talking about um, that carbon cycling and how long it takes to go into each reservoir. And so if you were to add carbon to our atmosphere now, how long it would reasonably take to kind of stabilize. Um, so once we ruled out all the other causes of climate change and stuck with CO2, then we then could start predicting, well, what might we see in the future? So we talked about different climate models and projections. And so we talked about the IPAT scheme and how you could come up with different scenarios, the different SSPs about what future climate change might look like based on choices we might make in our economy, in our society, and how that would affect greenhouse gas emissions. And so we got some pretty good projections that temperature is still gonna rise for certain, at least to 2040 to 2050. Um, and then what happens after 2050 is dependent a lot on what we do now. Um, and so we know the world is warm and it's gonna continue to warm. And so over the last two weeks, we've just been talking about, okay, what are the real effects now? The effects of climate change. So we looked at extreme weather, um, a variety of different factors. What we focused on this week is actually the effects on plants, right? We talked about um, the uh, um, uh, CO2 fertilization effect, for example, and how when you have increases in CO2, that actually can increase the rate of carbon fixation of plants. And so we talked about the difference between the light cycle reactions and the dark cycle reactions. Um, and then we got into this epigenetics about plant memories and stuff and plant stresses. Um, I want to take a little side spin on the plant angle. And because plants are not just about plants as odd as that sounds. So here's a plant, and then there's some stuff on this plant. And if you see this stuff on a plant, that's bad, okay? This is a large scale invasive species. These little eggs hatch and grow into these little buggers. And these little buggers eat a lot, okay? They eat fast and they eat a ton and they go in these widespread dispersal patterns, um, causing severe crop damage um, in places where there are crops. Uh, corn and sour gum are uh, particularly at risk for these little creatures. Um, they consume massively about 50 different species of, of uh, plants that aren't really important for economics. And then also um, about 30 species of plants that are really important for our food supply. So we call those economic plants. And um, these larvae that you see cause lots of damage by consuming foliage. Um, you only need one or two creatures per plant and they can completely devastate a plant, um, eating them all the way down to um, the ribs and the stalks. Like this is a corn plant and the whole thing has just been consumed. Um, just having about a little bit less than one larvae per plant on average can reduce a crop yield for corn by about 20%. Um, so who is this guy? This is the fall armyworm. Uh, 
Spidoptera frugiperida is its genus and species name. Since we're in a biotechnology course uh, program, it's always important to talk about the biology of these things. So this is a species in the family of Lepidoptera. Um, and there's actually several different bugs that are called armyworms. And that really refers to um, uh, its invasive behavior at large scales for their lava, larva. Um, but usually when people are talking about um, fall army worms, they're talking about uh, uh, Spidoptera frugiperida, this little guy here. And he may look like he's friendly. I don't know what you think about that. Um, but their life cycle is pretty intense. Um, that little bugger will lay a lot of eggs. A female can lay up to 2,000 eggs in her lifetime, usually putting about 100 to 200 per plant. They're really tiny little eggs, about uh, 0.4 millimeters in diameter, a little bit taller uh, lengthwise. Um, and the egg stage only lasts two to three days. In fact, their whole lifestyle, life cycle is only about a 30-day life cycle. That's in summer. It can, um, in cooler climes, like in winter, it can the life cycle can increase up to 90 days. But for most of what I'll be talking about are summer, um, uh, summer times. Um, so you start out with these little eggs. Um, they're not in these eggs for very long. And then these larvae hatch. And it will stay in the larval stage for about... Um, 14 days and they look fairly distinct. They have these bumps on their abdomen segment, usually about four of them back here. And then they have this inverted Y shape um, on their uh, different colored head. Um, so you'll be able to spot them pretty well and tell that it's an army worm. Uh, they can get up to anywhere between 38 to 51 millimeters in length. So they can get kind of pretty big. Um, and these things will just eat a ton of plants. Um, after their 14 days in this larval stage, they'll go into a pupa, they'll, they'll crawl into the ground and form a pupa. Um, that'll take about eight or nine days in the summer. Um, they do this in the soil, usually about two to eight centimeters deep into the soil. So if you go digging around, you'll be able to find a lot of these pupa. And then um, uh, once this pupa hatches, you go into the moth stage. Um, and this moth stage will last about 10 days, a little bit longer in, in winter, but 10 days in summer. They're nocturnal. Um, and this is a decent picture of one. Uh, they're not too incredibly large, about 40, about four centimeters across from wingtip to wingtip. Um, they attract their males using pheromones and they mate every night, usually once per night. They usually favor, they have this whole system where the virgins mate first, then um, those that have only mated once before get to mate second. And then at the end of the night um, are the moths that have already mated several times they get to mate later on. And so they kind of have this order to their mating style. Um, but the thing about these moths is they're capable of flying long distances. And it's part of their behavior to try and do so. Um, so that causes the species to have really strong migrating ability. They can migrate about 300 miles per generation. That's a long period. So once this thing um, can fly, it starts flying and they go out in all directions. Um, so fall armyworms are actually native to North and South America. Okay. Originally they were from here. They can't um, survive uh, winters when it freezes. Um, so they're, they have to stay in climates where it doesn't freeze. But because they're so good at migrating, um, you know, once they start budding in spring, they start moving northward. So in, um, you know, they'll have their full life cycle in um, 
in the southern reaches of the northern um, of North America, like say Texas and Florida. Um, but when spring and summer comes, they can migrate north as far as Canada. So what's shown in red on this little graph on this map, those are where they can live all year round. And then um, shown in these black triangles here is how far they can spread or usually do spread. So seasonally, they're seen throughout the United States and all the way up to the southern tip of Canada um, because they can fly so far and cover so much distance. Now, um, I mentioned that they're native to North and South America. You probably notice um, there's a lot of dots on Africa. Um, they are first found in Africa in about 2013. Um, and since then, they've spread through Nigeria, Benin, Togo, Ghana. Um, they're now in at least 28 different uh, countries. Um, the first major uh, crop damage reported was reported in about 2016. And now they're just all over the place. And they're causing huge amounts of damage in Africa. Um, why am I talking about this in the climate change um, uh, course? So there's an article, um, it's up on Moodle now as well, talking about climate change in this fall army worm. And part of the reason why it has made the jump from South America to Africa has been the climate change that we've seen so far. It's opening up new habitats. Um, and it's an interesting article that I've I've attached and I'll also send it out with this email. Um, uh, what they did here was they did an actual climate modeling scenario and merged it with a population uh, model. And they factor in, they, they start with the known distributions of the fall armyworm. That's what FAW is here in 2020. And then they looked at um, cold stress, heat stress, dry stress, wet stress, um, effective degree days, what, what temperatures uh, different places will be at. Um, they looked at two scenarios, one where there's a lot of rain and it's primarily rain fed and another scenario where it's where most of the water is coming from uh, natural and man-made irrigation schemes throughout the continent. And what they try and do is merge climate models with population statistics and population growth models based on these stressors to predict um, what's going to happen with the growth of these armyworms. And so right here, this is an initial prediction that's looking at um, uh, their habitat. Well, what's optimal habitat? What's okay habitat that would be considered suitable? Marginal would be eh, okay. And then white would be unsuitable. And so you can see over here um, what portions of Africa now are in the very optimal range for um, these fall armyworms. Um, now, if we look at the rainfall model predictions for growth, this is where we expect to see growth. Indicators for the fall armyworm. Um, this is under the rain fed model. Looking at their irrigation model, where um, most of the moisture is uh, water is primarily coming from uh, natural and man made irrigation systems. Here's uh, where they predict um, uh, optimal climates, that's in red. And then this is the growth under that scheme. And then they did some climate scenario based product predictions. Now here they didn't use the SSPs. They used the CISRO and the MURAC predictions, which they use slightly different um, uh, assumptions and slightly different methods. 
um, but nonetheless, they're climate predictors. One of the things that's useful about the Miroc um, and the CISRO is they have predictions for 2030, 2050, and 2080, whereas the SSP production predictions were primarily just about temperature, um, global temperatures, and um, didn't have were geared around 20, uh, 2100. So you can see with um, these climate scenarios that well into 2080s, um, these fall armyworms are going to be a big issue. And we can see that we're gonna get um, predictions of increased growth in a number of different areas. Um, let's see. So what did I want to say here? Just a little bit on the modeling. So like I said, these two models we haven't com covered before, um, but they're used to simulate the climate system and project future climate change. Um, they have their own assumptions that are a little bit different than the SSPs. Um, but just to give you an idea, of kind of how they compare. Um, let's see. Uh, if you'll look at the SSPs, so remember we discussed SSP one through five, I think we left out four, but if you look at SSP one through five, if you just look at the global temperature anomaly, by 2040, certainly 2030, 2040, there's no difference in the predictions. At 2050, we start to see slight differences in global temperatures. So when we look at the MIROC and the CISROC um, uh, projections, just bear that in mind that our SSPs don't show much of a difference um, at 2050. Now, when you get out to 2080, there are some more extreme differences. Um, but at about 2050, you're um, uh, only looking between a degree and a degree and a half difference between the models. And I just included a summary slide of our SSP models that we went over, um, just to give you an idea of, um, of what each model was about. Remember, they had different assumptions. Um, in terms of what choices we would make and what kind of world we'd be living in, in each model, and then try to predict a, um, a carbon intensity, energy intensity, affluence, um, and population growth, and factor that in to predict what our um, carbon emissions would be. And then based on those carbon emissions, and using the feedback loops that we're aware of uh, predict actual temperature changes. Now, again, these are global temperature anomalies. So remember, they can be far more exaggerated when you're talking about individual regions. Um, but the nicest one was the SSP1, where we immediately switched to um, uh, non-fossil fuels. And our final temperature rise ends up being in about a 1.8. Now, this is probably totally not going to happen. We're off, we're off the charts on this. We're probably already going to see at least a two degree temperature rise. Um, at least the current estimates from this year alone are suggesting that we might actually be at 1.2 already and on our way to 1.3 in the next couple of years. So um, climate change seems to be happening faster, um, probably due to feedbacks that we haven't correctly taken into account. Um, so probably our best guess, our best bet is this SSP2 if we start doing stuff um, uh, quickly. So I bring all these things up just to remind you of those when we go back to this um, to these predictions based on the Miroc and the CISRO. 
I don't know that we'll talk much about those models again in this course, um, but there's a few different uh, groups that have their own models out there based with different assumptions. And there are slight differences around the edges, but they all kind of agree um, on the general trend is generally bad. But we can see that these researchers, what they're doing is they're using climate change predicting models um, that cover regions, not just looking at global temperature anomalies. And that's the difference between CISRO and MIROC and the SSPs is these really do predictions you know, regionally. Um, and then you combine that with what we know about population growth of a species like the army worm or any other kind of species, and you can and start to predict their spread. And so this is clearly, the army worm is clearly in Africa and is clearly going to stay and thrive. Um, you see a lot more southward growth and migration uh, with these things. And so, you know, the whole point of this program, Biotechnology for Climate Change, is to come up with solutions, right? Is to come up with an answer um, some of these problems with workable solutions. And certainly any kind of threat to our food supply is going to be really, really, really important. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about solutions that um, are being attempted right now. So for current management, um, pesticides, obviously, is something that people turn to first. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to say they're cheapest, but there's companies out there that are trying to make a lot of money off them. So they're generating a lot. And so it is st stuff that you can buy. And so for um, the fall army worm, the two pesticides contain these two compounds, elatotropin and elatostatin C. And these are insect hormones. They're neuropeptides found in insects and crustaceans um, that play a normal <clears throat> role in their brain, uh, controlling their behavior around eating. And so when you add a, um, a latotropin and a latostatin C, um, for fall army worms, they've been shown to suppress feeding almost in all their life stages, increases their mortality rate, um, and decreases their survival rate for long-term into adult. Um, they had been shown to work fairly well. Um, with pesticide use, though, you always have worries about um, what effects it will have on humans, because remember, you're putting this on your food supply. And for these pesticides, these have to be nearly applied every day. So now we're, we're really talking about a surtax, a surcharge on any farmers that want to grow food, because now they're having to spend a lot of money on these pesticides, which probably aren't great for the environment anyways. Because although, you know, it's great that they affect the fall armyworm, not so great that it affects a lot of other insects, which are part of the food webs and the life cycle that all the other creatures need. So once you start throwing pesticides into the environment, you start creating problems for all sorts of creatures. Um, the other problem with pesticides is creatures develop resistance pretty fast. So already there's uh, many strains of um, fall army worm that are already resistant to these two pesticides. And so now there's a race to find more pesticides that can then, you know, fight off this little critter. Um, there's been some interesting papers and if people are interested in this particular project, there's a lot of good papers on it. Um, there's a company that's, I think it's out of the Netherlands um, that has been genetically engineering crops to express elatotropin and elatostatin. Uh, these are called BT crops or biotechnology crops. And so they're expressing different insecticidal proteins that help generate you know, some of these hormones. Some of them are um, uh, what are called uh, juvenile hormones, which can cause the uh, creature to never progress to the adult stage. 
which while it'll still eat a lot, if it can't go to the adult stage, it won't be able to lay eggs and create another generation. Um, so there's a variety of different folks that are working on genetically engineered crops that um, provide some kind of um, insect resistance. But again, just like with pesticides, you start getting evolution. You start selecting for some mutant somewhere because there's a lot of variation um, that's immune to the pesticide. They have many more uh, progeny. Those progeny are also immune. Pretty soon, that particular subspecies takes over the population because they can eat just fine. Um, uh, there's also an interesting article out there using biotechnology where um, a group is trying to genetically engineer a self-limiting strain of our male armyworms. So the idea is they release these um, genetically engineered male armyworms into the population and those mate with the females and then create armyworms that um, are just going to die off. Um, other types of, so these are um, the big science-y type. Uh, yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, I do have a question. So the last intervention that you have mentioned, genetically engineering self-limiting males, I just want to know how is this one progressing? Because, uh, for example, in my area of, uh, of research in malaria, this method has been tried to genetically engineer uh, male mosquitoes so that they, when they are released into the environment, they meet with uh, female mosquitoes and they, uh, they, will, they will just, uh, they are engineered in a way that they will only uh, hatch male mosquitoes so that at the end, the, mm -hmm. In that environment, they, they could have wiped out all female mosquitoes because they are the, uh, the ones which spread malaria. But the results of such uh, method is uh, not, 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 not in our favor because it's, it's, it is said, I'm not sure, I've not, I haven't witnessed it yet, but it is said that the female mosquitoes in the field they they sense that these male mosquitoes are not natural. They sense that they are modified and they refuse to mate with those male mosquitoes. And it's a challenge. It's, it works when they do a lab practice lab trials in the lab, but on the ground, on the field, it is not working. So I want to know if this one has been tried on the in on the ground and how has it been progressing? Um Excellent question and excellent point, and that's very very true. So one of the one of the initial things they have to see when they, um, you know, engineer one of these males is is it suitable for mating? To do the female select that mate equally well as they would, you know, a wild type uh, male, or do they do it better or worse in um, the article that I was reading and the research I was reading on the self-limiting strain of the army worms, they actually did that study and collected data um, to show that the females were selecting these particular males at the same rates, actually a slightly increased rate than some of the other males, than the wild type males. And that's a really important. Now, how they ended up achieving that um, we'd have to probably dig a little bit further in the research, but I'll send you the paper on this one so you can take a look at how they did the analysis, what kind of experiment they performed to try and, and, and determine first, before we even do the rest of the study, are the females going to try and pick the rest of the males? Now, what was interesting about this study is they were trying to they looked at specifically the um, rate at which BT re crop resistance and pesticide resistance was developing in a population. And they were trying to use these self-limiting strains of males to 
knock out the growth of resistance among the wild type population. Um, and so they have a lot of mathematics showing how they're trying to do that. I'll, I'll send you the paper because it's really similar in that, you know, if you're trying to fight malaria, you're trying to rule out a particular set of species that can carry the malarial bug, right? Um, and so I'll go ahead and send you that. Now, at the bottom of it, you know, there's that section where you've got references. And so if you see some uh, statements in the paper that you're like, oh, this really applies to what I want to know about. I want to know more about that. Find where it is in the references. And if you can't find the reference online, like in free text, send it to me and I'll get you the full text of the article, regardless what journal it's in. And so, um, and, and for a lot of these things that we go over, if it's something that you you find particularly interesting in your area or something you might want to focus on, let me know and I'll get you more detail because you're graduate students now. Now you're capable of kind of pe peeling back the layers, looking at some of these papers, and I'll help you with anything you're trying to read, help you understand it. Um, that's my role here. But, you know, throughout the lectures, both in this course and any of the other courses, if you see stuff you want to focus in on, let us know and we'll help you focus in on that stuff. Because by the end of these two years, we want you to have created this capstone proposal, an actual proposal to do something fighting against climate change that where all the science has been vetted. And it's something that could actually pass muster could actually um, uh, be submitted to some institution that would pay for it. And you could actually be responsible for something, you know, for fighting climate change or end up working with one of these groups that's working on this. Like for example, you know, these people that are doing the strain of army worms, if you're really interested in that on the malarial aspect, it might be neat once you get your degree to go work in a lab with these folks on their project so you can gain the expertise of doing the genetic engineering so you can then uh, cross over into um, Aegis aegypti or some other strains. Does that answer your question kind of? Yeah, it does. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, I'll send you the paper today and take a look at it, get some questions and then we can kind of follow this along. I could do a whole course um, on the self-limiting strain. A matter of fact, the paper is neat because it really walks you through the biotechnology. It shows you which genes were are being put in, how they're being put in. Um, I think I'm gonna give it to Dr. Harris to see if he ever wants to cover that in some of his genetic engineering course um, or to uh, Dr. Chowdhury when he gets to plant genetics. Um, okay. Now, remember, these aren't the only kinds of solutions. There have been solutions that, you know, humanity's um, come up with for, for centuries old um, in dealing with invasive species. You can do staggered planting, uh, which means, you know, you don't, you plant for a little bit and then you wait because you don't want to let the populations get too um, high. You can do intercropping with different species that, um, the army worm doesn't eat like cassava or yam. Um, in South Africa, they're trying pheromone lures. So they produce the female pheromones that lure the males into these traps and kill them. Um, and there's the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center. It's a nonprofit that's trying to um, uh, breed resistance in the maize against uh, the army worm. And in Australia, there's also an interesting article on um, a group that is trying to work with a caterpillar specific virus to um, kill the fall armyworm. So there's lots of different folks that are trying to start using biotechnology to deal with some of these problems. Um, if they're successful, that can have huge impacts on food security, at least if we're talking about um, the army worm, 
but it could have huge effects on health and disease. If we're talking about malaria or, you know, any of these other um, emerging diseases that'll be coming out due to climate change. So as you look through these different examples, if you see something you want to know more about, um, these are all credible cases where they're using credible biotechnology methods that you'll be like learning about in our program um, uh, to tackle these things. But this specific course that I'm teaching right now, it's just intro to climate change, right? So I want to talk about what climate change is, what some of the problems are, and I'm starting to get to a little bit about what are what what's our mitigation strategy? What are things we can do um, to help this? And that's why I want to bring up these last two slides. Um, so there is another option. Um, Cutesia uh, marginiventris is a wasp. It's a species of wasp. It's native to the West Indies. Um, although we do have it in the U.S. and Mexico and South America, um, it is the natural predator of the fall armyworm. These adults live about one week, and um, in the process of that week, they um, lay a larval egg inside uh, one of these armyworms, which hatches in about seven to ten days and chews up the whole inside of the armyworm and then comes out this little hole and kills that army worm. And one of the reasons why it's been so invasive in Africa is there really aren't these natural predators. And so in a, in a project many years ago, before they even went to Africa, here in the US, um, I think you know Dr. McCutcheon, he, she teaches your, um, uh, research ethics class. She's an entomologist. One of her um, initial projects was using this um, this species of wasp to control populations of army worm in the U.S. And they did some uh, research on that that proved to be quite successful. So one of the possible projects, if anybody is interested in, um, could be with Dr. McCutcheon. Um, we're working on trying to introduce this natural parasite, measuring its effects on destroying the army worm population and trying to decrease um, some of the damage that we see to crops. Because um, we certainly know that the species is going to thrive um, and continue to thrive throughout Africa. So think about it. Um, I'll post this uh, lecture up on Moodle and send it out to you guys. Um, but if that's a project that anyone is interested in, let me know. And um, uh, I know Dr. McCutcheon would would love, We when we were at the Africondo conference, this research actually came up and there were a cu couple countries that are really having a big problem with army worms right now that would love to see a student doing work on this which means it could lead to something fundable, right? <clears throat> could lead to a career and a job, saving the world and saving people. Any questions? Hello, Prof. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah I'm here. Yes, Prof. I want to find out, is there any research on uh, termites? like in some at invested lands and how um, it can be invested and yeah well that would be something we should do a search on okay, okay. so one of the things as graduate students um you know i know the answers to some questions but as graduate students one of the things that we really need to learn how to do is how to be really good at searching scientific databases um and I'm going to cover that a little bit in our next course that you have with me when we get to protein structure. But I'll try to cover it a little bit in this one as well, um, because you guys have great questions and they demand specific answers. So we should find that out. But I will take a look and then I'll show you how I found what I looked. So maybe I'll record when I do my search 
so you can see how I'm going about trying to find these articles and then we can discuss them. Thank you. Hello, Prof. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to add one on on this on the, the four army mm -hmm. At first, when it, when when it was it was discovered, at first the farmers they were using uh, washing powder to, to apply washing powder at the middle, and later on we we, we discovered that it had good effects on on human health since it is for consumption. Then we started we moved the, to ash using ash to apply ash. And in other areas where they are characterized by sand soils, to, to apply sand in the in the middle, where, when the lava will be growing, it will be being crushed by that sand soil. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, that's. So, where are you at now on it? How big of a problem is it where you are, and what's what's the current solution that's working the best? Right now, they are using in Southern Africa. I would say Southern Africa. That is Zambia and the and Zimbabwe mainly. That's where that, that, that challenge is mainly for 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 Amway. Right now they are using chemicals. So each extension officer, they are, when they give you like inputs, when they give farmers inputs, they are giving also the chemical chemical to to, to deal with for Amway. But right now, as, as time moves on, it, that those those the four amium, they are developing resistance to those chemicals. So they are coming up with different chemicals right. going on here. Yeah. Can you apply this one, this one? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it becomes a never-ending cycle of new chemicals that they want to dump in the environment. Yeah, and also we, we are not sure how, how, how like since it is a is for consumption with the effect of those chemicals. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. What do you All do? Right, you... Yeah, go ahead. I want to say, actually, also in us in back room, I we actually use the ash also. The ash is mixed also with like with the to uh, tobacco snuff that actually help in killing them and chasing them away when they are spread on the leaves. It chases the mm -hmm. the army worms off and yes, and the plants actually survive. Immediately when start attacking the the leaves, spread the ash, and if notice any of the insects on the crops, it is mixed with the tobacco snuff. There's the dried one and actually help in reducing their impact. So, um, for both of you, what do you think? Do you think that the um, introduction of a natural predator would be? No. An interesting way to go, as opposed to using chemicals. I think the natural, the local way, would be better than the chemicals, prof. Uh, yeah, I for, think so. for me, prof, I believe the cultural way and biological way. That's the only way to to deal with these chemicals. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. Great. Well, when you uh, when you talk to Dr. McCutcheon next in. Uh, in your next class with her, bring up the fall army worm. She'll be delighted. Yeah, we will do that. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. I'll have Thank more you, time bro. to talk on Monday. Okay, bye-bye. Thank, right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.